Good morning, dear guests at Sea Digital Summit by Webit 2015. Look around and remember this moment. Today, be active and meet a lot of talented people. Listen to top professionals sharing their knowledge. Discover innovations, network, witness the development of digital world, and party at famous Webit party tonight here again. Now, with all your energy, please welcome on stage the founder and chairman of Global Webit se series of events, Mr. Plamen Rusev. second to, to get my emotions back seeing that many people in that very room. Thank you for being with us. I hope you're going to enjoy every second of your time here. Vice President, European Commission, Honorable Ambassadors, friends, colleagues, that's our two days and we should take the most of them. Making the business taking place now here in my country, in the beautiful city of Sofia. I hope you've already managed to walk around and to take a look at how beautiful is this city, but now we're gonna make it look even better, smarter, more successful because of you. Over 3,000 people from 40 different countries are here gathered together. And I will try to make the beginning very clear why we are here, why we do this, what we are doing, and hopefully we will align on that. We are living in a very unique in economic history time when the globalization and the digitization are creating a very potent cocktail that is actually making happening companies like Google, Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, just to name a few of them iPhone was presented nearly seven years ago, but just few of us most probably remember the phones before that one. And we all understand that technological uh, advancement is, was so quick, breathtaking, but at the same time, we know that it's just only the beginning. All of us here in that room. So, just to say again the, word, the names of the companies I've started with, and in order for you to understand why they are so important. Because they've created a new breed of opportunities. None of them are actually aiming at niche markets. All of them are targeting and aiming at conquering the world, our world. 20 years ago, when I started my fascinating adventure in the digital technology, and actually my wife now <laughs> will be probably uh, saying that I make mistake, more than 20 years ago when I started this adventure, it, it felt like a kind of a lo lonely world, especially in this place, in this region where most of us in this room are born. Um, it, it was not easy to find people that say the same names, talk in the same language, but anyway, they were and some of them are now one of the most successful entrepreneurs. But we all felt kind of a, um, let's say a snowball somewhere at the top of a mountain. And look at this now, 20 years later. It's a gigantic avalanche that began from that tiny little ball there somewhere at the mountain. 
Now we are going through a global digital transformation. It's changing our lives, it's changing our societies, it's changing industries, creating new ones. In other words, we are now facing a societal transformation that will ultimately affect each and every person in this room, in this region, at this planet. The phenomenon of this digital, aka societal transformation, a, is that it's taking place globally, almost at the same time, almost at the same speed, and almost with the same impact. And another important phenomenon, that's why I've started with the fact that we are living in a truly unique, histori from history point of view time, is that this one is led by a handful, a few, few hundred technology illuminates coming from the Silicon Valley mostly. With armies of developers aiming at artificial intelligence, making things that were looking like science fiction just a couple of months ago taking place now. You remember, most of you, when the, the news about the driverless or self-driving cars hit the news. Most of us, even from the industry, were thinking that this is somewhere, you know, somewhere in the future. It will take many, many years, probably a decade. Well, most probably, all of you know that the majority of the United States states have already voted an act allowing that cars on the streets of America. And actually, there are more news around it. The United Kingdom is planning to become the largest country, the largest, the first and most adopting economy in the world, adopting the driverless cars on their streets in 2017. Two years from now. And that's a pure example of innovation. Take the car, remove the wheel, the driving wheel, remove the pedals and all connected controls. And come on, that's enough, not enough. Let's remove the driver. That's what it is. And that's what will take place in two years here in Europe. It's not even out there in the Silicon Valley. So what I believe we shall experience in the next years is the digital transformation being led by that handful, small number of technology innovators and uh, top entrepreneurs leading to a global revolution. One of the unquestioned geniuses of all times, the 67 years old director of engineering of Google, who holds I will be quoting now, 19 honorary doctorate degrees, inventor of the flat bedded scanner and the first text-to-speech synthesizer, holding dozens of additional patents. I'm saying this because it's important what I'm gonna say, what he said, most probably you know it. Was led to the conclusion that by 2029, computers will be able to do everything that humans can, just better and faster. He foresees the future as singularity. And this word describes the moment in the future when machines and people will become similar. Machines will come closer to the humankind and the humankind will suddenly be captured in the next level of the civilization. It is a kind of a chain reaction, he says triggered by mutually accelerating technologies that suddenly make everything possible that until now was only existing in the science fiction movies. We're talking about intelligent machines. We're talking about 3D holograms, you name it. This is what Thomas Schultz predicts. He describes it as a kind of a digital bing bang, after which the world won't be the same. It will be a completely new place, the place 
of technological, of technological change, it will take this change so rapid that will, and it will impact so deep that the human life will be changed forever. This is written, and that's why I've tried to read it carefully, in his book, The Singularity is Near, When Humans Transcend Biology. Another truth which is shared according at least to the president of the Singularity University is that 40% of all top 500 companies now shall not play a role in the future. And we are talking about the next 10 years. Probably it's not news for many of you here in this room that actually 70% of the global trading in the United States is taking place because of algorithms. And that is not even close to artificial intelligence. It's somewhere in the very, very beginning. The companies who do not adapt even more, who are not leading the digital transformation, which is the motto of this year's Global Web series, will most likely not be heard in the future. Whole industries disappear and shall further disappear. There are so many publishers here in this room. Remember how many of us, how many of you thought about this dramatic change that changed the whole model. How many of you predicted the bankruptcy of so many players and the rise of new ones in the same industry? Now when we talk about the, the driverless cars, imagine how many taxi drivers will be left without job? And I'm smiling not because I'm happy, but because nobody's thinking about it. That's funny, but it's reality. The driverless cars will become common on our streets so recently you can't even imagine. What about the artificial intelligence? I'm sure that only few of us can imagine the impact that all these technologies that we all are leading here in this room and we are going to be challenging are actually going to, to impact and, and change industries and of course consumers' lives. Today you may sequence a human, sequence a human genome for like $1,000 for a couple of hours. Imagine how this will change medicine actually how it is changing the medicine. These technologies are impacting each, each other, but still they are not working in synergy. They are kind of going each its way. Imagine when a common platform is uniting all of these and creating a synergy between them. And this platform is called AI, in, uh, artificial intelligence. Imagine the speed of information. Imagine what will happen for everyday things in our life. Imagine how the innovation will go. Imagine how every single business will be changed because of the big data, because of the predictive analytics. Imag actually, stop imagining. It's happening today and we all know it. And singularity is here as another great person bearing responsibility for most of the innovations in, this part, in, in the world these days is saying. He says, the singularity is already here. It is not something that just happens next Tuesday at 9.40 a.m. in the morning. It's a process and it's taking place right now. This is Sebastian Trun, the founder of Google X, laboratory responsible for the driverless cars for the products such Google Glasses or contact lenses that measure the blood, uh, blood sugar levels. And of course, many, many more. Tran also says, it's not the naysayers, but the optimists who will change the world that we are living in. And of course, as a sequence, that such people will amass wealth and power. And I'm, 100% sure that that would be the truth. And this is the reason the Webit community grows at four continents. 
And this is the reason to invite you, all these optimists, for two days here, two days in Dubai, two days in Jakarta, most probably also in Shanghai, and of course in Istanbul, during all our events around the world, to change the world together, to make it a better place to live, and of course to grow our businesses as much as possible. Because that's what it is about sustainability. It's about creating value and, of course, building up your business further. We are changing the world with attendees from 110 different countries. So far, Webit Events has welcomed over 40,000 people around all the continents. And at every single event, we change the world welcoming some of the best startups from each and every part of the world, in this case here from Central Eastern Europe, inviting all of them, providing an opportunity to exhibit. These startups are from areas such as um, access, software as a service, um, energy, social. We have hardware, infrastructure, commerce, money and payments. All of these you will see outside, of course. Entertainment, big data. And Global Webit Series became, we are the most startup friendly enterprise event in the world. And we became the doorway for the enterprise and the startup world to collaborate for innovation. Recently, I've heard some good news, but before I share it with you, um, just to give you an example, uh, last year at, at uh, at Webit, the Global Webit Congress in Istanbul, there were a bunch of great startups from Africa. One of them that we helped even to fly in there, one of them was created by two girls from Kenya. Those who've been to Africa can imagine what I'm saying. Two girls in Africa. Kenya is a, is a country of, I think, over 47 uh, tribes. In some of the tribes, they buy female for 10 cows. They buy women for 10 cows. That's the price. You can check. In this very country, two girls created the startup called Ilumi that is changing the way education happens in Africa. So how can I not, and we as a team, help them? Of course we did. We brought them to our platform. We introduced them to all the media. Wall Street Journal and all major media published articles about them. We helped them meet with investors. We made sure they got funded and they are changing now the world of education in, in their own continent. That's what I call sustainability. Not just giving two euro for charity, it goes deep into the sand. Making difference, creating sustainable businesses, which all we have here is actually our religion and we believe that we can follow it. But let's not talk about Africa only, because the reason we are here in Sofia is not only because our core team is Bulgarian, and I'm a proud one in that case, but also because that's where the whole Webit series started, growing around the world. And when we started it, we had only one reason to do it, to help local businesses, to help local entrepreneurs grow their bigger dreams and global con conquer the global world. That was our idea, and we still go after it because we believe that that's what our mission is, helping each and every one of you to make business. So from our humble be beginning, from Central Eastern European roots, we continue growing our commitment towards the local stage, towards the countries that you are all coming from. And that's where I've heard another great news, which I've already mentioned you about. Recently, through a very close friend of mine, I've heard that three young Bulgarians are proving the fact that the right time is now. Two boys and a girl at their early 17s won award for their robot they've built from various sources using their pocket money and were selected among the 100 plus candidates at the, the, the Vienna Science Fair 
and the agency for nuclear, um, uh, the agency for, for nuclear, um, the MAT, whatever, it, I, mean, I forgot, the, forgot the, the, the abbreviation, in Vienna, Austria, and they won a couple of first awards, all the first awards they can win. And as a Bulgarian, I'm so proud that our country has grown these talents, and hopefully our society here in Central Eastern Europe shall manage to create opportunities for them one day to work and to create here their future in their offices, hopefully in Europe, in Central Eastern Europe, in Bulgaria, and not to chase their future in Silicon Valley, in Asia, Africa, or America. And the nice surprise for me and for you now is that I'm presenting you those three young people here. And who knows, probably, maybe, hopefully, one day, they will be overshadowing the glory of uh, the Jonathan Asuf with the Bulgarians pre feel pr proud that he's one of the first electronic digital, uh, the inventor of the first electronic digital computer, or Kurzweil, or Trump. So now, please, a round of warm welcome and applause for Nikita Ovsyannikov, Venetia Georgieva, and Boris Zumbulev. Come on, guys. I'm so happy to see you here. I'm uh, so proud to see you here. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to show 17 years old people on that stage. Never happened before, so you're the first one. You know, you have one more record in your life history. So I'll be, you will see the robot out there at the pitching stages of the startups later today. I have only one question. How do you feel kicking out that many people and creating something that, I mean, why did you create this robot? Well, um, the initial idea actually came from a sci-fi movie and uh, we felt really glad about uh, bringing that idea to life. Okay, uh, so they're, they're just telling me that there's somebody who wants to see you later on. Oh. Um, we're talking about the vice president of the European Commission. Thank you. I thank you. All right, so this was, this was a short one, but I know these guys don't speak that much, and I want them to start speaking. Now, do you think, I mean, I've already said that kind, it, it's kind of like science fiction is now giving up the way to the reality. Uh, more, more reality is happening than science fiction, or not? Wh what do you think? I would say yes, You're mainly because our idea comes from a science fiction movie, and we're partially able to bring it to life uh, with as much funds as we could by now, but eventually as we try to invest more and more time and resources into it, we'll try to develop it and do the big uh, and possibly life-changing idea that we took it from. Okay, now let's challenge Boris. Now, tell me, w I mean, I know that it, at 17, it's hard to plan your future, but be honest, do you see it in our region or you see it somewhere else? How do you foresee it? Let's, let's imagine 10 years from now. Well, uh, what I see is that this technological revolution will take, well, as you said, it's a global revolution. So uh, it doesn't matter where you come from now. It means what you're, uh, it, it, it's important what you're capable of. So in the end, it doesn't matter that I'm a Bulgarian, that it could be African, as you mentioned. The, the example you gave, and such creations can come from all over the world, so it doesn't, yeah. Great. Can you imagine what is the stress these guys have here on the stage? Can you? <laughs> Thank you, dear. And I wish you a wonderful, give me a kiss here. Give me, I, w I want to have a picture. Kissing a future <laughs> talent. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your life. And I'm sure that I will be seeing you here on the Webit stages in the very future. Thank you for being here.
You know, such young people give me the hope that and absolutely prove the the hundred percent understanding of mine that talent is totally equally distributed around the world. And we as business, because we are here the business, we as society are obliged to make sure that their lives, the future, their career, their talent will grow here where we are. Because that's what we are doing. We have to create the opportunities and to embrace them. We have to create people who are ready to take the next wave of the human transformation, not only digital one. And now let's talk about business. We should not be a spectators. We should be the leaders. We should be the mastermind of all the things that take place in our industry. That's why for the next two days, we shall be discussing a number, a number of parallel events here at SEEDS. Innovative technologies, digital transformation, advertising, big data, money and payments, internet of things, actually, internet of everything, education, health, machine to machine, connected and smart cars, e-commerce, brand social strategies, digital marketing, advertising, programmatic, Everything that is changing the world today is going to be challenged at these very stages here in Sofia. CEOs, founders, CTOs, CIOs, CMOs, and all CXOs here in this room are here to make business, are here to listen to our amazing speakers where is the right time now to say a big thank you for committing your time and efforts to be here with us. Who will be sharing their know-how and knowledge, being responsible for Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asian territories. I hope that we are going to be having an amazing two days, and I hope that you may embrace the opportunities that arise and make the most of it. And our team is here to make it happen and to help. You will see our team everywhere. You will see them with T-shirts. If anything you want to say, please tell them. If something you don't like, please tell them. Tweet it. And I even tweet if there is no soap in, in the toilet or whatever. Just tweet it, and we will make sure that everything should be okay for you because you are here to do business, and we are committed to this. Super thanks to all of you who came from 40 different countries, and including, of course, the host country, Bulgaria, but Romania, Serbia, Poland, Ukraine, Hungary, Croatia, Slovenia, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Germany, Austria, Albania, Turkey, UK, Saudi, Netherlands, many, many more. Special thanks to the amazing speakers, as I said again, for committing, because that's very, very important. To summarize, the digital transformation leading to a global one and societal transformation is a phenomenon that is still misunderstood. Remarkably, it's worse understood by the policymakers. It appears that they have not yet decided whether to dive in and to lead the change or to stay and just look at it. After all, we are witnessing not just the, tri the triumph of a single technology, but we are witnessing the whole future change. And from that perspective, we are not talking about the internet. We are not talking about Snowden. We are not talking about social networks, not about intelligence services that are following our information somewhere, or the question, what is Google doing with our personal data? We are not even talking about the whole new industries that are created every single day, or about the fact that 19 years old is uh, 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 selling a 20 billion euro um, a company now. We are talking about the need of a new framework, embracing all the opportunities, but at the same time keeping the human at the center of the technologies, at the center of the equation. We need prepared and educated policymakers who to build the need, so needed, fast adaptable framework that is aligning with our businesses and the technology adoption.
you know, still one rule is in power. It's about the quantity. And here I will quote my father who says, a piece of medicine can make you stronger, can make you healthier, can make you happier. But too much dose can kill you. We need the policy maker who, and it's about time to define the dose, not to fight with us, but to define the right dose and make sure that our businesses grow bigger and better every single year. These are the people that we need to work together. Also, we need people to make sure that we create dreamers. Where are the dreamers? Where are the people who are foreseeing, capturing, and going to the moon? Where is the, the emotion that it was spread around years ago? Why are we so focused on the everyday things that are taking place? We need the dreamers created in our schools. And this is again about the policymakers. We need these dreamers here in Europe because that's the only way Europe can become again the leader, both in digital technology and innovation. We need a total change because of the amazingly fast changing environment around us. And hopefully we are gonna have it. We need the dreamers who will make the future happen. If we want our home continent Europe to play a real role in the future, our policy makers should master this framework. Let's face it, there are so many companies who do not align with the legal framework right now. Do you come up with one quickly? They're not, you know, they are illegal in most of the countries. But still, they are evaluated at $41 billion. Almost as much as the valuation of the oldest, largest financial institution in Germany, Deutsche Bank. And you know, the, the issue is that there are so many policymakers who would, wouldn't even understand the word that I was using in this presentation. I wouldn't get a thing because they're not ready and it's normal. That's why we need to support those that are ready. And the good news is that there are such and they need our support on their quest because they have the same quest that we have as an industry, proving to the rest of their colleagues that the future of Europe lies in the education, in the dreamers, in the digital transformation, in the single digital market, in innovation, and this needs to be fostered as much as possible. Russia has a cosmonaut. America has an astronaut, the first astronaut, the first cosmonaut. There is a country in the world that also has the first, the first person in the world who ever did a digital transformation of a whole country. Do you care? I mean, come on, let, let's talk. Which one is this country? Which one? Uh, do you know which one is it? Yeah, I know it's not Bulgaria, so that's why you say it very, yeah, quiet, but it is Estonia. People are using the word honored quite often, which is actually lowering the power of the world. That's why I use this word very, very rarely. But ladies and gentlemen, right now, I'm truly honored to say that this very person is here in this room. And here I would like to extend my special thanks to the European Commission representative here in Bulgaria for making this happen. Also would like to extend our special thanks to the president of Bulgaria who last night gave a special cocktail for all, all our VIP guests at the, president, at the office of the president. Also would like to give a special thanks to the mayor of Sofia who is among our patron. You see? Even I am thanking to the government. Imagine, there is something to be thankful for. Because you know that 
I believe that we should support, not to get support. We should make things happen, not to expect somebody else to make our business happen. And I'm a true believer in this. But now, as I said, I'm feeling special, very proud and honored to host here at this very stage the Vice President, European Commission Digital Single Market, and past Prime Minister of Estonia, Mr. Andrius Ansip. <laughs> Mr. Ansip, it's honor. Please feel, feel at home here. This is the digital home of Europe today, so you should be, this is your home. Yeah. Sorry to say, but I'm not an astronaut. I'm not <laughs> a cosmonaut. Uh, um, you are the people Please. who have dreams. You are the people of uh, changing the world. I would like to thank you cordially for all you did to change the world already. And uh, thanks to you, we don't have to talk about digital and non-digital economy already because thanks to you, all the economy is digital already. So thank you. It's my great pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much. I, I know your quest and I think that a lot of people in this room are aware of um, where you're heading. You're heading to the future of Europe. And I'm not going to exaggerate, or at least that's my personal belief, that you are the person whose shoulders are now bearing the responsibility for the future of Europe. And I'm sure that you are not going to be agreeing with me because you are um, um, modest, but uh, I'm sure that this is what the audience here feels. So, digital single market, that's the key word, this is the hashtag that we are all tweeting, supporting where you're heading. But Please say it in your words, what is the digital single market from your perspective, from perspective of the, of the European Commission? Digital single market in the European Union is not only my, my dream, but uh, this is also my aim. Uh, we were able to create a single market in physical meaning in the European Union, uh, but in fact the digital single market uh, does not exist in the European Union right now. We have 28 different regulations dealing with uh, digital issues, dealing with uh, uh, consumer protection rules, uh, uh, but um, <coughs> in fact uh, those excellent regulations, they are creating barriers between uh, member states. We have to create digital single market in the European Union and all the people, all the entrepreneurs uh, in the European Union, outside of the European Union, all our citizens, they will benefit from digital single market. Talking about the digital single market in the European Union, where we are talking about three pillars. First one, free movement of goods and services. Second one, infrastructure. And the third one, industry. Talking about uh, free movement uh, of goods and services, uh, we have to deal with the uh, fragmentation of uh, this market. Uh, we have to provide harmonized uh, regulations uh, uh, for our entrepreneurs and, and citizens uh, uh, today, uh, especially small and medium-sized companies. Uh, they don't know how those regulations in uh, uh, 28 uh, different countries uh, they are protecting consumers and, and what kind of obligations entrepreneurs uh, they have in those countries. And the message is, is quite clear for entrepreneurs, stay at home. But um, this is not the right message we have to, to send on to our entrepreneurs uh, here in the European Union in the 21st uh, century. We would like to provide harmonized uh, uh, model contract uh, law uh, which uh, will make uh, more easy uh, for our entrepreneurs to provide services all over the European Union. We have to deal with uh, uh, parcel delivery, talking about e-commerce. Uh, this is underdeveloped area in the European Union. In some uh, member states, uh, uh, e-commerce is highly developed, but in some other 
Uh, you member states, uh, people, uh, they, uh, they are not so used to those possibilities to buy online or to sell online uh, so oftenly. And one of the main obstacles is uh, connected with the high uh, cost of uh, parcel delivery. And we would like to ask for, for more transparency in this field. How, on, on what uh, those, uh, those prices of uh, parcel delivery, uh, they, they are based on? Because today it's, it's unclear. Then we have to deal with the geo-blocking. Uh, in the physical meaning, geo-blocking is uh, illegal in the European Union. But in online world, we say it's the uh, basis of our business model. And uh, we are saying no to our people almost every day. And uh, in the European Union, it happens even thousands and then millions of times per day. And rerouting is this quite polite way to say no to our citizens, to uh, our companies. So why our people, they have to visit some other shops where they are asking for, for higher price. So abolishing of uh, <coughs> uh, geo-blocking is, uh, is uh, really needed uh, in the European Union. Then copyright issues. Copyright is um, um, mentioned to, to protect both our people and creators. Uh, but um, it was Queen Anne who gave right to make copy in the year 1710 already to somebody. And somehow our copyright uh, mentality is still in the very beginning of uh, 18th uh, century. We have to allow cross-border access uh, to the digital content, to movies, to uh, films, uh, to e-books, uh, to our citizens, and of course, portability of uh, the digital content. This is also something what is really needed today in the European Union. There are approximately one million uh, Europeans sitting at home who would like to get cross-border access uh, uh, to digital content uh, uh, from another country. But today they are blocked. There are you know, 271 million trips uh, with uh, at least one overnight stay in another EU member state made by Europeans uh, uh, during the year. Those people, they would like to get access to their legally bought content in their home country. But today, sorry to say, in many cases, they are blocked once again. It's impossible. So we have to allow cross-border access to the digital content and uh, the portability of the content uh, for our citizens and for our companies. Then taxation issues. As we know, uh, in many, many cases, uh, uh, when companies, uh, especially small and medium-sized uh, uh, enterprises that uh, they are selling uh, cross-border, they have to deal uh, with uh, many uh, tax offices, tax departments. We have to improve our uh, one-stop shop system, this single window system. Theoretically, is a, is a really good thing, but uh, uh, we have to improve uh, this system. Uh, we have to set uh, quite a uh, high level of uh, threshold uh, for our small companies. Uh, uh, under what uh, those uh, companies, they, they don't have to, to declare their VAT. It was proposed already during the year 2004-2008 when we discussed about those issues uh, uh, by the European Commission to set uh, uh, threshold on the level of 100,000 uh, euros. Right. But it was rejected at that time by uh, member states. Now uh, people in uh, many countries, especially in the United Kingdom, where uh, this threshold is already quite high, 81,000 uh, British pounds, uh, they, they are complaining. And we have to, to listen to uh, those people and we have to change our regulation. This was 
about free movement of goods and services. But yeah, we have to talk also about uh, infrastructure, about platforms, and uh, as it was said by or McKinsey, 10% um, more broadband, it means uh, uh, plus 1.3% uh, uh, of uh, GDP. So um, this is, this is uh, quite, quite a remarkable increase of, uh, of GDP. Um, <coughs> we have to, to talk about uh, uh, industry-related industry issues, about uh, uh, standards, uh, about interoperability, um, talking about uh, 4G, we have to say that the situation in the European Union is, is quite different in different member states. Uh, in some regions, in some countries, 4G is a reality today. People, they can enjoy uh, those benefits uh, provided <coughs> by those modern technologies. But in some other regions, uh, uh, governments, uh, they were asking for highest amount of money when they were selling those spectrum allocation licenses uh, and of course, uh, those telecoms, uh, they, they are postponing uh, the their investments because uh, they don't have this money uh, for investments anymore. Because uh, the Estonian company changed their uh, whole industry called Skype. Oh, it's <laughs> not because of, uh, of this um, Estonian company, um, <coughs> which uh, changed uh, the whole industry. But uh, in... Uh, uh, Scandinavian countries, in, in Baltic countries, for example, governments, uh, when uh, uh, they uh, were organizing those spectrum uh, allocation uh, auctions, they set concrete uh, conditions, uh, uh, including time limits uh, for uh, uh, those companies uh, who took part in those auctions. And uh, the aim of the governments was to, to cover uh, the whole country uh, as soon as possible with uh, uh, this uh, innovative technologies, uh, the 4G. In some other countries, governments, uh, they were asking for high highest amount of money. And of course, uh, you can get a uh, much bigger amount of money uh, selling uh, uh, spectrum when uh, uh, you are not setting those preconditions, uh, uh, including time limits. And uh, I cannot agree with those people who say that uh, uh, what's the difference? Uh, uh, are people they using 2G or uh, 4G? I think uh, there is a huge difference. And we have to remember that uh, a really glorious time for uh, Europe, uh, which was a GSM time, 2G times. But what does it mean? At that time, we were able to set standards, European standards. And that's why we were world leaders at that time. Uh, we have to repeat the same for uh, uh, 5G. Talking about industries, uh, we have to talk uh, also much more about data. Uh, until now, when we are talking about data, we, we were mainly talking about uh, data protection, which is also really important. Trust is a must. People, they have to trust uh, uh, those uh, internet-based e-services, if they don't trust those services, uh, they will not use uh, those services. But we have to pay much more attention on data as a resource, as a very, very valuable natural resource uh, as commodity. This is the business of the people in this room, and I'm sure yes. they want to hear more about it. Um, what are your plans here? Okay. Um, Personal health records. In some member states, uh, uh, personal health records are owned by patients. And in those countries where personal health records are owned by patients, it's very easy for patients to ask for a second opinion from other medical doctors, even from lawyers if it's needed. And, uh, but in, in some other countries, um, those health records, uh, they are owned by, by hospitals. How we can talk about uh, real free movement of uh, patients uh, when uh, in some countries uh, in the European Union, patients, uh, uh, they don't have access to their personal health records even. 
So data ownership, this is a very important issue, but it's also a very complicated issue, and we have to talk much more about data ownership in the European Union. But when I'm talking about digital single market in the European Union, I'm not talking uh, about only about the Europeans. We are creating this uh, digital single market in the European Union for our own companies, for our own citizens, uh, but uh, we are creating this market also for the companies uh, from uh, third countries. So everybody will benefit from uh, digital single market. And of course, I would like to count on, on uh, your support in creation of digital single market in the European Union. Let me give you back a little bit in time uh, when you were the Prime Minister of Estonia. Um, the the e-governance, the services, didn't happen with a magic wand, right? It, 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 it took time. And actually, it, it took quite a lot of time. Uh, since the very beginning, when you've launched the, uh, the, the digital signature, uh, until the, the, the real adoption, um, there were quite, what, six, seven, six years, something like this, I think. And at certain moments, you have announced that it's a compulsory to have such, right? I, am I right in that? And then everything happened. So um, how, how do you see it? Do you, are you planning on compulsory? And what, what's, your, what's your vision here? Uh, yes. Uh, I said it many, many times uh, that uh, I don't want to talk so much about Estonia's experience because according to my understanding, Estonia is not perfect enough to teach others using uh, our own example and, uh, and of course we didn't reach, uh, reach uh, this final destination. You're right, we have uh, people yet from and, and hopefully we will never reach uh, this uh, final destination. But um, yet somehow we have to say that, uh, that uh <coughs> Things are just happening, but uh, we have governments. Uh, they they have to make the right decisions at the right time. Also, in Estonia's case, uh, we implemented uh, our smart ID cards uh, uh, in a quite early stage. But in fact, Finns they did uh, even a year earlier than Estonians did that. But in Finland, it was voluntary based, but uh, in Estonia it was mandatory. It's um, up to you. Do you ha have your travel passport or not, but you have to have your smart ID card. It means in the year 2000 already we provided to our citizens a dig uh, single digital identity. And we now we, we have to say that uh, it was quite smart decision because uh, mm, uh, all those service providers, it doesn't uh, matter, uh, private companies or private banks, for example, or uh, governmental services, uh, they, they are much cheaper today because uh, uh, service providers, they don't have to create uh, uh, all these new identities to their customers. They already, customers already have identity which is protected by uh, the government. But it took uh, from the idea uh, even uh, six years when uh, Estonians, uh, uh, they gave altogether one million digital signatures. We had a layer which uh, allows, uh, we call it X-Road system, which allows to cross those information through a relatively small uh, different databases. But uh, people and state institutions, uh, they didn't use uh, this layer uh, so much. And then in the year 2007, uh, we decided to implement so-called once-only principle on the level of law. So what does it mean, once-only? It means state has right to ask information from their citizens only once. And second time, to ask for the same information is prohibited. States has to remember and to use once again this information, of course, of course, according to my permission. And this once only principle gave real boost in usage of uh, uh, digital uh, signatures in Estonia. It was like explosion. So 
one single simple implementation of one solar principle. Now Estonians, uh, uh, they are giving more than one million digital signatures uh, during the week already. It's very common to sign digitally in Estonia. Altogether, Estonian people, they identified uh, themselves digitally more than 440 million times. Population uh, in lot. Estonia is 1.3 million inhabitants only. And this uh, single digital identity allows to use all kinds of uh, very different uh, uh, digital solutions. For example, in banking, 99.8% from all the bank transactions in Estonia, they are made uh, uh, via the internet banking system today. 95% um, of those people who submitted their personal income tax declarations, uh, they use so-called e-tax form. Since uh, the year 2005, we have in Estonia e-elections. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, when we had uh, first time all over the country those possibilities to vote electronically, only 10,000 Estonians, uh, they really voted electronically. Uh, but uh, uh, this year, for example, we collected uh, more than 30% from all the votes uh, uh, via the internet. And I'm absolutely sure we have to provide modern possibilities to take part in public life also for those people who are just living in the internet. So when people they can trust their money moving somewhere in the internet, nobody knows where. So why they cannot trust uh, their votes also moving there in the internet? As I said it, uh, in the very beginning already, trust is a must. You're using the word trust, but it's funny. People trust their personal data. They trust their money, their personal life. Everything that comes personal, they trust it to some companies. But how many are trusting the government? So where is, the, where is this leverage of trust? How do you think it's going to be achieved? And Let's even talk about the industry, that the people who are here in this room. How do you foresee the digital single market? And again, the hashtag is digital single market. Uh, one word. How do you foresee changing the advertising industry, ch changing the, the, the IoT, the, uh, the big data, cloud? And I know in politics nothing happens from today to tomorrow. Uh, probably how do you see it in the next five to ten years? How do you see it brings real power to the business in Europe? And since you're talking so well, and I can hardly interrupt you, also, how do you foresee helping the startup ecosystem? How do you foresee, because one startup is five jobs. Only one startup, one small thing creates five jobs. And obviously, with 50 plus percent in unemployment among the youth in Spain, and the same levels, or hope thanks God, lower, but high levels of un young, uh, unemployment among the young people. Um, how we all trust these efforts of yours that the digital and technology will change this for good, of course, and for better. So how do you see this change in the next five to 10 years for all the people here in the room? Yes, uh, I absolutely agree uh, with you. Startups are doing a really good job, uh, not only in, in Europe, but around uh, the world. And uh, in the European Union, for example, only in uh, app industry, we already have 1.8 million jobs today. But uh, in the year uh, 2018, according to some prognosis, we will have 4.8 million jobs in app industry in the European Union. It means plus three million jobs only in, in app industry. So uh, startups in, in Europe, uh, they are very innovative, uh, they are very flexible, but environment is not supporting to scale up uh, 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 for those start startups here in the European Union. We have to, to ask from ourselves uh, why our smart brains, uh, startups, uh, uh, they have to move out from the European Union to scale up. Why 
Spotify, for example, which was uh, created in, in Sweden, um, decided to, to move out from the European Union to the United States to, to scale up. Now Spotify is back here, and I think uh, um, those who are uh, using their services, uh, they, are, they are really uh, satisfied. So, and we all know that uh, there is a strong correlation uh, between uh, legal downloads of Spotify and uh, illegal uh, downloads of uh, yeah. Torrent, for example. So everybody knows uh, that the piracy is, uh, is free. You don't have to pay for pir piracy. But if somebody is uh, able to provide better quality, higher speeds, and uh, generally speaking, if somebody is providing legal access to the content, then people, they would like to access, uh, act as, as honest taxpayers, honest people, they are ready to pay. So we have to create an environment in the European Union which allows to, to scale up also uh, here in the European Union and uh, digital single market is exactly answer uh, on your question. Yeah. Do you think there's a leverage um, to the markets in the States? Because when you say scaling globally, let's face it, all American startups actually scaled up at the market of 360 million. Here you're opening a market of almost the same online users, but let's say around five plus million real. So do you see it as that? Do you, do you foresee it as uh, you know, leveraging these opportunities that European startups will have equal to the American startups? Okay. European startups, uh, uh, they, they act in the, in the United States and, and, uh, and the, the Americans, uh, they say that uh, those are American startups, but uh, Spotify <laughs> is uh, still a European startup. Uh, Rovio, for example, is uh, the European startup and, and uh, Skype was also a European startup. We have lots of, of really good ideas uh, uh, here in, in the European Union and uh, uh, our marketplace is uh, uh, much bigger than uh, the American one. Uh, more than 500 million have to uh, customers. Uh, this is a huge uh, potential, but uh, uh <coughs> we have to tear down those barriers separating our member states today. We have to create a, a digital uh, single market in the European Union. Uh, you mentioned uh, trust and, and healthcare. Uh, those are really important issues in, in the European Union. Um, we have to, to change our copyright uh, uh, legislation in the way uh, uh, which allows to, to use uh, the those innovative tools. So I'm talking about uh, text and data mining uh, also here uh, in the European Union. So. Uh, I said it uh, already sometimes, but um, I, I really believe in, in big data and uh, data analytics, uh, and uh, uh, I'm quite sure very soon uh, somebody will give, some medical doctors will give me a call saying that uh, Mr. Rantis, uh, please go immediately to the hospital because uh, most likely you will get stroke after six hours. I will not be extremely Please happy. Please get some water. I don't uh, want this I to happen I here. I will be not uh, uh, extremely happy about uh, uh, this phone call, but I will be extremely grateful. And uh, I really believe it is possible to find all kind of correlations which will be beneficial for our people, for myself, uh, uh, from big data, uh, uh, it is possible to find uh, uh, similar patterns from, from big data and uh, it's up to you to create uh, those uh, uh, really beneficial solutions for our people and it's up to policymakers to create an environment which allows to provide those services to all people.
Mr. Vice President, as we are pushed by time, and I've already asked the audience in this very room for the business support for your initiative. Um, again, repeating the hashtag digital single market, what would be the, the words, the final words you would, be, you would like to address them with? So let's do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it was honor to have here the Vice President, Single Digital Market, European Commission, Mr. Andrus Ansip. For the media, we are going to have our press conference just in a couple of minutes outside at the conference area. Thank you very much, Mr. Ansip. Thank you. Honor. <laughs>